Welcome and thank you for joining us tonight. We're excited to bring you our next presenter in our quarterly writing workshop series. Today's presentation is with Sarah Rafael Garcia and we are going to talk about food writing. If you have any questions during the workshop, please post them in the chat and we'll get to them at the end of the program. So I'm gonna start with introducing our presenter. Sarah Rafael Garcia is a writer, community educator, and a performance ethno ethnographer. She's the author of Las Niñas and San Santana's Fairy Tales, co-editor of Pariah's Writing from Outside the Margins, and the forthcoming sci-fi anthology, Speculative Fiction for Dreamers, as well as the founder of Barrio Writers and Libro Mobile. Currently, she splits her time between shipping books out to loyal readers across the nation, teaching ethnofiction through contemporary narratives, and developing an archival ethnofiction project for the life of Ms. Modesta Avia as a 2020 USLDH Mellon funded grantee. So welcome, Sarah. We're so excited to have you. I will turn the presentation over to you and I will come back at the end for questions. Welcome everyone. Um, so normally this is a lot more interactive workshops. So what I'm going to do is definitely use the chat. And by now this day and age and after the, or during the pandemic, uh, everybody's familiar with raising hands and emojis, you know, anything that's available through Zoom. So feel free to communicate that way as well. Um, one of the thing, the way, one of the things that I wanted to start with, because it's a great icebreaker and it gets, uh, we get to know who's in the room, um, is by sharing, maybe um, putting it in the chat, like your favorite, um, or just reminiscing, brainstorming about your favorite childhood food. And I say that because of the topic that we are going to be focusing on today. So it's like writing about you. Um, history, culture, um, and sometimes just reminiscing about your favorite childhood food says a lot of who you are and uh, what's your food, that, what's the food you grew up with, and maybe even the region of where you're located or where you grew up. So if, think about that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about mine and how I got into food writing um, because I think it's also important for you to know a little bit about me. Uh, I actually never really aspired to be a food writer, um, but because uh, so much of my childhood included just different types of food, um, a lot of my memories are drawn from that. Um, and one particular memory that always stands out that's in my first book, it's called Patas de Rana, Frog Legs. Uh, and that's simply because, you know, I did experience frog legs as a kid not at all part of our culture. I'm Mexican-American, Chicana, first generation. Um, but my dad used to work for the Orange County Register and he would read it during his breaks. He was, you know, in the, in the, in, in the print room pushing paper through the machines, but on his breaks, he would read it. And he read something about frog legs being part of French cuisine. And it's like what the upper class folks ate. So he wanted to expose us to that. Um, but of course, you know, we couldn't afford to go to a French restaurant or I don't even know if there were any in the area. So he decided to make them one day for us as a surprise. Um, funny enough, you know, he didn't really do anything different than what he would have done for carne asada. So he just grilled up some frog legs, served them on a plate and added salsa and chicken and, and sorry, salsa and ketchup on the side. And was like, here, try, let's try frog legs, and then gave us whatever tidbits he got from the newspaper. Um, it's a funny experience for us growing up because, of course, you know, so many of us don't grow up eating frog legs, um, but also, you know, everybody's reaction was different in our household to frog legs. My dad was like, try it, it tastes like chicken. And my mom was like, I'm not even trying it. And so therefore, the three girls that we were growing up had different reactions as well. But it also, bonded us as a family because it made such a, a, a such an impactful memory of how we experience different cultures in our house and and to me that's still a memory that I retell and retell to friends and 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 you know and and also now my husband and and his in-laws who think it's funny that my dad made carne asada frog legs right um but a childhood food 
that I love is flour tortillas con mantequilla. And we'll talk about that more about how it developed into my food writing. We have some comments in the chat it says, mom's carne isada and rice. Nobody makes it quite like her, not even me, despite my best efforts, says Jess Romero. Yeah, rice, my mom is the queen of, of rice and mine gets close to it, but not like that. And carne guisada, I still don't know how to make. So that's a good one. Um, and then Jennifer says, I definitely looked forward to visiting my grandparents for Greek food. But the joke in my family is that I would eat a steak no matter where we were. If there was a steak, I would ask for it. Yeah, it's, I mean, even steaks, like the way people eat red meat is, says, so, is so telling of culture. Um, and I think that's, for me, something that, you know, teaching my husband how to cook a steak medium rare was a thing for us because he never had really eaten medium rare, like meat. He always like, no, it's carne asada. And, I mean, carne asada, and you just cook it well done. And I'm like, oh, I don't really like well done. Not anymore, but I grew up with well done. Um, so going back to how I started writing for about food was that I, my, my memories were tied to food. And so I started just including it in my stories and not necessarily focusing on the details um, of the food, but of the impact on our lives. Um, but then once I got older, something huge happened that definitely changed my way of, of interacting with food. I became gluten intolerant. And that is huge for a, a, a young woman who <laughs> was raised in uh, eating flour tortillas my whole life. Like I come from the uh, Mexican culture of flour tortillas versus corn, right? And so many folks prefer corn tortillas, but not me. Like my grandmother's made flour tortillas and their connection to flour, uh, to flour tortillas is is that is like my grandmother's it's a tradition that was passed down um to some of members of the family not all um and no one no one else but my grandmother's make flour tortillas like them like my mom couldn't come close um, and she was ridiculed so much by us and and family that she just stopped making them one day because they were nowhere comparable to my grandmother's tortillas um and both of my grandmothers made flour tortillas and so when I became gluten intolerant, that was a huge thing. I felt like part of my culture um, was being taken away from me. And especially because it was such a ritual for me, it was like, you know, when in doubt, I had a flour tortilla and mantequilla with my coffee or when I needed a snack or I needed comfort food. Um, so when I had to stop eating them, it was definitely a big thing in my life. And it also made me deconstruct my connection to them, right? And what exactly was that I upset about, that I couldn't eat flour tortillas or that it meant that that was part of my culture being um, erased from my daily life or daily routine, right? Um, and and the very first ex like experience I had with food writing was being asked to contribute to Eater, which if you got the handout, that's one of the articles that's on there to read, um, was, you know, a good friend of mine, Gustavo Ariano, who's an, a super amazing food writer and critic, um, among other things, historian as well. Um, he asked me to write a story uh, to contribute to this eater collection about, because they were covering Mexican food around the US. And he says, oh, you grew up with flour tortillas, write about that. And I was started laughing because I thought, me? You're asking me to write about flour tortillas? I'm gluten free now. Like, I was like, that's torture. And then he goes, oh yeah, I forgot. And I'm like, well, I'm gonna write about what it means to not be able to eat them anymore. And what started out to be a joke, cause I said, oh, I'm gonna write about what I would do to eat a flour tortilla with refried beans from my grandma, um, from either grandma, right? Um, turned into this feminist piece of connecting feminism to my grandmothers and the what they did on top of making flour tortillas as part of their ritual in life, right? Uh, and I never meant to go there with that story. I mean, I definitely started the story thinking like what it would be like to have another real flour tortilla from my grandmother's, which both are still alive and I, um, but they don't make them anymore. Um, and it, you know, like what, what do I remember from that experience? And then it turned into this more identity piece on feminism and and gender, um, you know, as what it meant to not be able to eat them or not be able to make them like, you know, make the tortillas like them. 
Um, so when we are, I'm going to pull up share this, a prompt for us. Um, so one of the things that I encourage folks when they're talking about or exploring food writing um, is, is to brainstorm what is the one food of your childhood or your go-to comfort food. Um, who made it for you first? Did you learn the recipe? Do you still make it? Um, and if so, when is it the perfect time in your life to make it, right? Because there are things that we still take on as part of culture, right? Um, a lot of folks still make mole for weddings. Um, a lot of folks um, still have their traditional ancestral food for, in times of celebration and in times of mourning. Um, and so those are some of the um, tidbits that I, you know, or tips, should I say, that I give folks when you're brainstorming on how to approach, approach food writing. Um, and then one of the things that's very key to me is analyze, remember all the senses, not just the obvious ones. So what did it taste like back then? Was it, what does it taste like now? What smells remind you of it? What sounds remind you of it? What emotions are triggered by the taste, smell, and sounds related to it? And to me, that's one of the, the things that's really important um, is about what emotions are tied to it. When you're writing about you and history, um, you know, and culture, there's definitely emotions and triggers, right? And good and bad, right? So you have to really get to first, what is the food? What is it? What moments in your life is it connected to? Um, and uh, and then go from there and keep keep deconstructing it, right? Oh, just as Hispanics usually don't eat any pink red uh, red meat. No, my husband it he had no idea what it tasted like until I introduced it to him, and now he loves it that way too. Um, and then my family, my sisters and I are the only ones that eat medium rare meat. Um, but so when we're going back to connecting to those moments. Um, you have to ask yourself why. And then something else when we're doing food writing that is an, an, a very important tip for me is also to recognize that most food writers that get published are men. Even though there's a stereotype that women belong in the kitchen, right? Um, and then not on top of that, most food writers that get published are white men. So then you have folks dealing with different cultural food, right? Um, so there are two things that I always that I always say when you start to write something is to also create a list of cliches of that food because that's what you want to avoid. You want to avoid the cliches. You want to avoid the stereotypes. You want to avoid discovering or um, even the word exploring something, right? Because we want to honor that this food existed before us and there's a story behind it, right? And now if you're inventing something and you're writing about some a new dish that you yourself are coming up with, because I have heard those in past workshops, um, then okay, then you don't have to worry about that. You still have to worry about cliches because there's so many in food, right? Um, like pigs in a blanket, right? Like that's a cliche um, that was, that's also part of a food item, right? So you want to make sure that when using language, you are giving the reader something new, right? A new way to experience the food you're talking about. Um, and that's what's mostly important. Now, I also want to share the, um, oops, let me stop sharing that one. I want to share the, what the handout that went out. Uh, let's see. Oh, it still goes to that one. Okay, stop sharing. Oh, there it is. Um, so one of the things that got me through the pandemic, as with plenty of other folks, was um, reading and cooking. I didn't really do as much cooking as I thought I was going to, or, or like as much 
um, experimental cooking as I thought I was going to do because I really got into the books. Um, and the book that I started reading that really drew, um, drew me in, and I even had a book club with it for, with local friends, um, was called uh, Eat Joy. Um, and what I really found interesting about it is that it is styled with through emotions. Um, so for, for grief, um, for heartbreak, uh, and then for confusion, right, and, and anger. Um, and so I really enjoyed that book, but one of the things that stood out to me about it the, about it the most was that it was equitable. Um, like I had mentioned earlier that most food writers are white men. Um, this one was 50% people of color. It also included queer narratives, which I thought was extremely important as well. Um, and it introduced me to so many writers, I had no idea were doing this type of writing. Uh, so most of the samples that went out in this handout were from Eat Joy, like um, Rakesh Tell's piece is from Eat Joy, um, Natalie, um, um, but I, I always forget how to say her last name, but <laughs> Bazil is from Eat Joy. Um, and then you have mine. When I had to give up flour tortillas, I lost my culture, and that's from Eater. But um, th there's another great book that I recommend, or a series of books that is, that is um, the best uh, um, American food writing. And if you see those anthologies, especially you can find them at secondhand stores all the time. Um, also note that every piece that's published in those collections are also available online um, for free. So that's what all of these came from um, accessible places. So this one is from an, the best food writing um, anthology. And then this last one um, by Anne uh, Lee was actually from the Artist and Writers Cookbook, which uh, is another one by Natalie um, Eve Garrett, who wrote Eat Joy as well. I see there's a comment. Oh, there you go. Jennifer put in the comments. You can check out Eat Joy from the library. You can find it in the catalog here. Awesome. Shout outs to the Fort Worth Library for having that as well. Um, so now that we're thinking like how to approach it, is there anything, um, maybe, uh, well, you know, since Jess is in the room, Jess, is there anything in particular uh, that you want to write about that we can brainstorm a little bit? Or um, would you like me to continue just with tips? Because I can go down the outline. I'll wait patiently. Um, and I'm also going to pull up something else while we're doing that. Oh, we do have a comment from Best. It says, I'm interested in the idea of memory and food. I love nonfiction writing, but I, it can be very heavy. It can be very heavy. So one of the reasons that I really enjoyed Eat Joy is because they're vignettes, they're short pieces. And that to me is what really draws me to anything, to writing or to reading. Um, and it was very concise, short stories that approached both of those, um, food, memory, and as well as emotions. And I just thought this is a great example of how to deal with something briefly and include a recipe um and go from there i'm gonna pull up my piece um so that i can explain the template that i used uh and then we'll we'll continue with the outline that i have let's see so when i like i mentioned earlier when i started writing my piece i was never expecting um to actually oh, i want to get smaller um, to actually write it uh, as it came out. It was something that I thought about writing um, because I was asked to write it, right? And something that uh, was really close to emotions, but I had no idea when I started it. So one of the things um, when I think about writing or, or a particular style is I study a lot of other folks. And if I pull up um, another example I'm going to show you where I got my inspiration from. So just by reading this first paragraph, when I'm desperate, I heat up a rice tortilla na comal, you know, the kind found at alternative grocery stores, organic without a trace of GMO corn and, and unsatisfyingly gluten-free. 
nothing like homemade tortillas or tortillas from the local Mexican market. So this template of starting with action is something that I always tell folks to do. It's like literally put us on the plate with you. Um, and also right from the beginning, you know my emotion, right? Like this desperation, this frustration. Um, and you know right away it's dealing with being gluten-free and tortillas. But I think, you know, um, something to note is that with when you're doing creative writing, you have to read a lot. You have to read a lot and then make notes of why something sticks with you. And one of the things that stuck with me um, when I was reading pieces were the other writers, right, that I, that I experienced. And the very, I'm going to share the one that I feel like really brought me in to all of this. Okay. So one of the first pieces that I read that I still ling lingers in my head um, when I was trying to figure out how to approach food writing was this piece, the struggle of eating well when you're poor. Now, part of it is because I can relate to it. Right? As a kid, we never ate out because we, our family didn't have that luxury. And our family also didn't like junk. My parents particularly didn't like us to eat junk food. So we never really had like Cheetos or Ding Dongs or, um, or any, any type of American junk food that other kids had at their lunches at school that we would, you know, stare at and wish we could eat. Um, but this particular story dealt with a lot with emotion and grief. And you can you know, read in the first couple of sentences to know what it's about, right? Um, and you'll notice that it's very similar to my beginning from, from the gluten-free tortillas experience. So just reading the first couple of sentences, I unfurl a bag of chips, barefoot and alone. I keep the lights out. I drop my shoulders, bend my neck forward, and allow my mouth to be happy when it meets the salt and the grease. I eat one chip, then two, than the entire bag. Eating saturates nothing, not my hunger, nor my sadness. So in three sentences, this author, shout out to Marissa Higgins, um, tells you what she's writing about, right? Uh, and entices you with the food at the same time. Um, so I think, you know, for me, one of the things that I tell folks is read and mark what you like. Um, there's no, there's no, uh, like, there's nothing to say that you cannot follow someone's template. If, if you are remembering it and if you're engaged by it, then you should be learning the style of the piece, not necessarily the content, your content, your own content will fill that up, but to use the style of the piece, how does it begin? How did, how does it introduce the recipe? How does it connect to you, even though it's not related to you, right? Um, there's other pieces that I read that did not incorporate my identity um, in any way, but it made me feel the emotion enough for me to be engaged with the piece. And that goes back to, again, don't use cliches. Give, give the reader something different to experience. Even if you're just talking about spaghetti, something that everybody knows and has experienced in some way, right? Um, either out of a can or homemade pasta. Um, and so you want to tell the reader what in particular makes your dish special. And if that means it's your grandma's story of immigration, then that's what that, where that story is, is gonna end up weaving into. Um, and you have to think about that again, ask those questions at the beginning. Um, so I'm gonna share the steps for, we're going, continuing to brainstorm on how to approach creative writing. Okay. So we talked about brainstorming and how important that is. And also um, note that it's not something that is going to happen overnight, right? Like you might have an idea um, of what you want to write about, but you, you also have to let it take its course. Um, and one of the things that I always introduce to, to folks who are even beginner writers or advanced writers is know what you're comfortable with um and for me when i start drafting because it, it's always a draft it's never a polished piece at the uh, at the beginning um i know now that i'm a weaver 
as when it comes to writing. If I tell myself, I'm only going to write 200 words, that's all, that's my goal. 200 words is nothing, right? So, well, to some books, it's a lot at the beginning. But 200 words, and I have a template, I have somebody's essay that I like, for example, Marissa Higgins. So I just need to drop my info into that style, right? And so that first sentence, I literally was like, what can I say about eating a flour tortilla in the way that Marissa Higgins did about a bag of chips? Um, and that's all I did. I gave myself permission, creative license, right? Um, to use literally copy and paste the first paragraph put in my info because I knew I was not going to come close to the hurt topic. So that helped me start my page. Then I started going to these questions. What did it taste like back then? What does it taste like now? What smells remind you of it? What sounds remind you of it? What emotions are triggered by the taste, smells, and sounds related to it? This became like questions that I, I literally stuck to my laptop and kept reading. And what was most interesting is some amazing memories came out of it. I had forgotten that my grandmother used to literally crack open a can of beer and turn on the little tiny, um, you know, record, uh, not record, sorry, radio that she had next to the dirty crock pot of beans because <laughs> it was dirty because it was always filled with bean juice and stuff. Um, and that's how she started making tortillas on Sunday mornings. And I thought, wait a minute, grandma drank beer in the morning when she was making tortillas. And I didn't click until I started like deconstructing. How do I remember the sounds? How do I remember the occasions? Um, and that was my abuela Cata who works six days out of the week. So the only day she could make flour tortillas was Sunday. And so sometimes she didn't go to church. She'd stay home and make food for all of us instead. Um, and so I started realizing all these little, you know, descriptions that I hadn't caught on to growing up. Um, and with Maria Luisa, um, one of the memories I have is always being super eager to wake up early when she was making tortillas because it meant I cut the first tortilla and got to be by myself with my abuelita Maria Luisa, which was rare because there was always a house full of people. Um, in both cases, right? But one was a very quiet house and one was a very loud house. Um, so that was where all of this brought me. Just repeatedly thinking all those fine details that I want to describe to someone who is, has not experienced that with my grandmothers. I'm going to stop sharing to read, um, yes, the treasured first tortilla. And now, good thing that you note that, Jess, because you yourself have had your experience with the treasured first tortilla, right? So how would you describe that? Don't tell me what it tastes like. Tell me how it makes you feel, right? Or how it made you feel. And why did it make you feel that way, right? So we all know more or less what a flour tortilla with butter tastes like. It's like having toast, right? Like it's a staple in a lot of homes. Um, and so it's like saying, you know, what would white, white bread toasted with lots of butter or French bread, right? A baguette with with, uh, with lots of butter tastes like. But it's not so much the taste because it's a very common, familiar taste. It's the experience, right? What led up to that? What is the first bite? What is the last bite? And how would you describe that? And in my essay, one of the vivid descriptions I did want to capture was the way I ate it because I would cherish that last bite, that greasy, buttery last piece of tortilla that had too much butter on it that I'd have to lick my fingers after right um and i also ate my tortillas from out to in like so i would tear off pieces from the outside and eat it in because all the gushy butter was in the middle so i didn't want to eat that right away or have the butter spill onto the plate and i literally had to process that and say how do i say that elegantly in the message right um and so i'm going to go back to sharing the screen so we can continue with the prompts now then, once I realized like, well, this is what I wanna focus on and be able to identify scenes from my past, from my memories, and write like what, what made Abuelita um, Cata's tortilla dif experience different from Abuelita Maria Luisa's experience, um, I started thinking like, why does this matter to me? Why does it matter to me that I can't eat flour tortillas anymore? So how, how has it become to your identity? What culture did it represent? Will you pass it on to someone? If not, what does that mean? 
right? Um, and this could apply for something that's not part of your culture. Maybe it's the first time you eat escargot. Where were you? Were you traveling somewhere? Did someone, maybe it's your, your life partner introduced you to it. Um, you know, maybe it's, it was a food challenge. Maybe it was you trying to be more sophisticated because you were at a French restaurant, right? Um, so you have to like really deconstruct the meaning behind the food and the experience. Then that brings us to where do you begin? How do you write about it? What brings you to eat it again? Why do you want to write about this, right? Or what keeps you from eating it again? Is it something you don't like that you're forced to eat? I've, I've heard plenty of those stories too. And then I realized that the person writes the stories and finds this amazing nostalgic memory tied to it. And they're like, well, maybe I'll try it again or I'll just keep sharing the story. Um, when do you make it? Why won't you make it? How do you talk about it? Why don't you share it with others, right? Um, so these are all questions that you have to ask yourself before you even really start writing. And then, you know, you start worrying what's easier for you. If it's, for me, it's always starting with the template. Um, and that's the easiest part for, for me to start at. And then doing small scenes and then finding a way to weave it together. Right? That's why I say I'm a weaver. So I always say 200 words, that's all I need. I need 200 words to start. Once I write those 200 words, I go away. I go away even if it's just for two hours or I sleep on it and I come back the next day. And then I say another 200 words, uh, which means I read the 200 words that I read, that I wrote previously, line edit, like, did I say something cliche? Is something missing? Um, can I say this differently? And then I add another 200 words and it's like that. And so then I'll go away after those 200 words are done and then I come back and edit everything, line edit again, even the first 200. So now this, by the third sit in, I'm editing 400 words, doing the same thing again, add another two to 300 words, right? Um, and you kind of have to know what your goal is. Um, if you want to do vignettes, because you're drawn to short stories, I encourage it. I, it's an easier goal to meet for some people. And then you might realize I am not a short story person. I need a good 1500 words to get to my to my final you know, ending. And 1500 words, you know, 12 to 1500 words is a good for online print. Some go as short as 800. So that's kind of like a, a vignette. Vignettes just are short, concise stories. So they could be anywhere between 100 words to maybe 800 words. Um, and then you have long, like longer pieces. Like for Eater, I had a, a cap at 1600 and I think I went way over it. And then my editor helped me um, bring it back down. And I have to say that my editor, even though they were not of my culture at all, <laughs> because she didn't understand uh, how recipes were passed down from my paternal grandmother to only me and my mom and not my dad. She's like, no, don't you mean your, I'm like, no, 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 it doesn't work that way in my culture. Um, so she didn't understand those things, but she understood food and she knew what spoke to her. So she really helped sculpt my piece. And so when I tell folks it's a draft, it's always a draft and you're probably going to get to three to four revisions, um, before it's finalized. Um, Jess also wrote, I actually ate escargot the first time at Rise in a clear fork for my birthday, in clear fork for my birthday. It was a very special occasion. Yeah, I love escargot. Um, I had it, a uh, total side story, I had it in China. I lived in Beijing um, for two years and talk about food experiences there. I also went to Thailand for a vacation while I was in China and I had grasshoppers off the street. Delicious. It's when people ask me, what I would want to eat again from Thailand, I say the grass, lemongrass grasshoppers. They were delicious. Um, and I ate them on a dare. And I ended up eating the whole bag and loved it, like, like as if it was kettle, um, kettle um, popcorn. So, so yeah, you have to definitely brainstorm the root of your experience, right, with that particular food. Now, how do you get it to, from not being too heavy? I think that's just a personal choice. I mean, some of the stories that I have read have been really heavy. Even Marissa Higgins' piece that we um, that I started with, you know, mourning her grandmother who had passed and and admitting that that the only you know her her grandmother gave her 
TV dinners, and that was nostalgic for her, right? And, and again, because we were here for. Um, and other folks are talking about really, you know, um, even having a bad breakup, but they didn't focus on that other person. They literally focused on how they comforted themselves through food and why that particular food was comforting. So I think that's the probably the secret to not getting too heavy is again, focus on the food. If you focus on the food and just sprinkle in the emotions, um, then you have a different way to share your experience of what you're talking about, right? Um, and, and I think it would also, for me, I found it very cathartic, right? Because I ended up getting to the end of this piece, um, which I'm going to bring back up so that you can see my ending. Um, ended up getting to the end of the piece and realizing, oh, I'm okay not being able, you know, not, not eating um, flour tortillas. It doesn't mean I lost my culture, right? Um, and I think that was a really important for me to say to myself. Um, and, and what was even more important was that um, I received affirmations for, for weeks after this piece came out, people from every, like across the US were emailing me. Um, and they weren't all um, Mexican Americans or, or even gluten-free. Um, so they, they understood the, what ha this cultural divide that happens when you have any health issues that you cannot continue to eat food of your culture, right? Um, so I'm gonna get to the ending. So my ending is, is this, now I have to count the starch I eat per day and I get angry whenever I see people who have the fortune of being able to eat flour tortillas turn down the opportunity. That's so, I still get angry. I still like tell people, eat it, eat it for me. Both of mis abuelitas are in their 80s, living in their respective homes in Texas. Both survived major surgeries. One had a stomach tumor the size of a melon and the other a brain tumor the size of a man's fist. Abuelita Cata recently injured knee surgery and has difficulty standing for long periods of time. Abuelita Maria Luisa is limited by a wheelchair and a few years ago, she lost full movement of her arms. These days, they both spend less time in the kitchen. Yet it is both of mis abuelitas who shaped through how they approached making their incomparable flour tortillas, how I approach my own womanhood. In my way, I am a product of their lives. I know it is their rituals that gave me permission to create my own, whether I eat flour tortillas or not. And that was that I did not have that answer at the beginning of this essay. Um, and I really, you know, uh, went through the process myself. And, and to find my entry point, I, I recreated the meal that I missed, of course, with gluten-free tortillas. And that's why the essay starts with that experience. Like, what does this make me feel? And what exactly am I missing? Is it the flour or is it the experience, the connection um, to that moment in time, right? And I realized it has nothing to do with the flower tortilla. It has to do with what they meant in my life and who, who made them for me, right? And, and those moments that I had um, as a child with my grandmothers and also as, as an observer of judging who they were as women of their time and, uh, and sometimes criticizing them because I thought, why would you do that? Why, you know, you have some, you can do different things. And because I was, you know, questioning their gender roles or the, the gender expectations that they had even on me. Um, and without thinking, they have their own story and connection to that ritual and what it means to them to prepare it for us, right? Um, so that part is really important about going through the process. And one of the things that I do want to take this opportunity um, because we have Jess in the room with us and Jennifer, I, I welcome Jennifer to participate, is think about the one childhood you do want to talk about, right? And how how would you describe it? Now, I have two examples of of how you described it before, right? Mom's carne guisada and rice. Nobody makes it quite like her, not even me, despite my best efforts. I mean, I could put mom's Spanish rice. I could put abuelitas flour tortillas into that description, and it would still fit. But I want to know why the carne guisada 
is different from the ones I eat at restaurants, from the one that you make. Give me a detail that has, does not exist in that explanation, right? Um, maybe she dances in the kitchen, right, um, while she's making it. Maybe she tells a story each time she makes it. Uh, maybe she cooks it the day before, so she doesn't have to cook it for the day after, right? So there's different, you know, um, connections to that piece. Um, you know, one of the things that I always talk about um, to folks that I eat that nobody really eats is liver and onions. Um, and my grandma, uh, uh, you know, Abuela Cata was the only one that liked liver and onions and my dad. But when my dad died, when I was 13, I no longer got to eat liver and onion onions in my home. So it had to become a ritual for my grandmother and I that only happened on rare occasions, right? Um, uh, Jess says, it's actually blander than other, um, than other I've had. Mom isn't a great cook, but that was her best. Um, yeah, there's a story behind that, Jess. Uh, and I think there's, there's more to it, right? Like, uh, and maybe it's the effort that your mom made to make sure you had a hot meal on the table, right? And so I would say, ask yourself those questions, go through the ritual um, and, and tracing those steps on why the carne guisada stands out for you. Okay. Um, oh, can we get a copy of the prompts? Yeah, for sure. Um, I will send it to Jennifer and um, let me see, unless I can add it here, no. I will send it to Jennifer and uh, she can send it out to folks um, to, to try the process. Something else I wanted to share while we're here is examples of other um, styles of writing, right? I talked about the vignettes and then obviously Marissa Higgins' piece is longer and my piece is longer, which again, I didn't expect to write that many words. Um, but the other part, the other ones that I have here are a lot shorter. Um, and I'm gonna see if I can pull up one to show you. So this particular one is um, from the Artist and Writer's Cookbook that again, Natalie Eve Garrett also put together as an anthology and asked different folks. And this one is like, she asked even artists, right? So this is a, a photographer, Anne Miley, who remembers her grandmother's substitution soup. Um, and this goes back to, again, a cultural and um, reference and memory. So it starts with, we had just finished celebrating the new year and gone to sleep when we were awoken by wild shouts, loud explosions, gunfires, and flares. The communist had infiltrated Saigon and a small platoon was taking position in the recess of the entrance to our apartment building. They fought there until they were overrun at dawn. I was born in Saigon and spent my early childhood there and Hugh, Vietnam. While I was too young to have been shaken by the fear, chaos, and the helplessness of a daily life of war, I, of course, could not forget the Tet Offensive. And I still remember being dropped off at school early one morning, only to find the school gates demolished and still smoldering from a mortar attack. So in this particular piece, she goes straight into history and drops you in or where you're at. Um, and it's not, it's actually not very long. Um, you have one paragraph, two paragraphs, three paragraphs, four paragraphs, five, six, seven, eight, nine, um, ten. But ten very short paragraphs. And she literally started with the history. And, and this is one of the pieces that I really was drawn to because I wanted to talk of the history of flour tortillas, but also how my, why my grandmothers were making flour tortillas in the United States, right? Um, and so I, I did mention in my, my case and created that analogy to the Bracero program because the only reason my family's in the United States is because my grandfather was a Bracero. Um, and so that means he worked with his hands and worked on the land. Um, so that made a clear connection to his wife, um, Abuela Maria Luisa, right? And so I did bring in the history, but to me, that was not the focal point, whereas to Anne My Lee, that you know, the she went straight into the history of what she remembers as a kid. Because I'm sure when she was thinking of a childhood food, that's what the first thing that came to light, what was happening during that era, right? Um, 
Yeah, it just says, oof, that's a chapter in history, but I said it was exactly. Um, and so I think that's, you know, another, another entryway is to talk about the history of, of your family and of your culture and how it was, how the dish that you want to focus on is influenced on that, right? Um, is influenced by that. You know, we, tamales is one that people can write about tamales in so many different ways because often it's tied to a holiday or a particular recipe from a family member, right? I, I still remember the day we tried to get my grandmother to make tamales without lard and she wouldn't even eat them after she made them. Um, so, and then for us, it was for health reasons. And she was like, why, why would I even make the tamales without lard? I'd rather just not make them. And then of course we were like, no, we, we want the tamales. Uh, I think, you know, you can take so many different angles and introduce them at the beginning of a story. And that's just one example. Um, another one that I also recommend, let me look it up. So one of my now favorite writers um, is Natalie um, um, Basile because I had no idea that she is the one that also wrote, um, pull it up, that also wrote the show Queen Sugar. And if you haven't seen that and you're, you're in Texas, so I highly recommend it. Um, Queen Sugar started off as a novel, very long book. It's not a short story of any sort, but it focuses around region, um, which is just, you know, in, outside of New Orleans. It focuses on black culture and history in the United States, sharecroppers, like the history of the land in that region and, and farmers and sharecroppers. Um, but it also revolves completely around food. Uh, and again, it's like you can't, talk about culture and history without food. And this particular essay, I read it, I had already been, I had already been immersed into the TV show Queen Sugar, but I had no idea that it came out as a book first until I read this um, essay. And this whole essay, the way that she works with time is by leading up to this journey that she took to spread her father's ashes. It's comical, but also tragic, right? Because she um, decides that she's her family, which includes her mom and her sister, decide that they're gonna spread the, uh, her father's ashes around the Boudin Trail. So literally going to different sa sausage places in the Boudin Trail to find a way or a place to put ashes, whether it was behind a fridge, in the bathroom, you know, just different places and then not telling folks that they were doing this. So it became a journey in itself um, that processed uh, emotions, made it kind of funny, um, and then also experienced a region and a tradition that she had with her father, right? Um, and so I think for this one, even though it's a little bit longer, um, it had a beginning and an end, right? And that helped tell me, okay, she's starting with, you know, her dad already passed. She's not telling us about the, fun the funeral. She's like getting off the plane and this is what I experienced and this is where we're going. And then goes into the whole Boudin Trail. And then she also covers the history of the Boudin Trail a little bit, right? Um, and so here's the beginning in which I think again, drops you into action, gives you time right away. It's two o'clock on a Thursday afternoon in early May and the air inside the New Orleans airport smells like fried shrimp, mildew, and a hint of the Gulf. It's a comforting smell, at least to me, and every time I fly down here from California, the first thing I do after stepping off the plane into the terminal is LDP, right? And that's when I say, like, there's, you can say more than, than being humid. You can say more that it's in the Gulf, um, you know, New Orleans has so many smells to it. So there's, she could have gone anywhere with this, but I think using fried shrimp, mildew, and a hint of the Gulf, is just a new um, description, right? That we wouldn't, I wouldn't think uh, putting all those three things together. Um, and then she gave us a time and put us in into place right away. Um, so this is another one that I highly recommend reading and exploring for templates um and finding what what catches your attention and just the the 
the style of using a beginning and an end that you already know exists is one way to also help you keep it brief and engaging. So that's that. Um, let's see. One of the other things that I um, also wanted to talk about a little bit is revising. Um, so one of the tips that I gave early on was, you know, to avoid using cliches, but also avoid using like words like exploring or discovering, um, because one, they're overused, and two, it's creating that whole idea that, um, you know, that syntax where you are discovering a culture that has existed for many years. So it's, you know, the, the, the better uh, approach would be to give the history of, the, of it, right? Or just say, you don't know. I think some people will be engaged by that as well. Um, but also, you know, to create those, those lists, like I mentioned at the beginning, um, to help you identify when you are using stereotypes and cliches um, and to keep you from using them. But when you're going to revise mode, you have to keep an eye out for them um, because you can't really start writing and expect not to have, you know, things that you, that you may or yourself not recognize when you're speaking that become terms of that are too familiar to people, right? Um, and I'm sure, you, you know, there's like as sweet as pie. That's another one, right? That's that's a term that everybody is familiar with, and it's not a fresh term, right? And it's and it's a in, in a reader's eye or a writer's eye in that case, it's considered a cliche. And so you really want again to create a new uh, phrase or a new experience. Um, and sometimes that's okay, like using terms from your childhood. Um, I remember I read a story that talked about like the texture of food. Um, and, it, you, you know, somebody was saying, oh, it was squishy like a marshmallow. And I'm like, yes, but a marshmallow, people, that's what people say. It's squishy like a marshmallow. But um, how, how would a child describe that in different ways? Like squishy, like when you, when, uh, as a snail, when you, you know, step it on, step on it on outside it. At, on the sidewalk, right? There's different ways um, to describe things. So if you're going for a grotesque experience of food writing, then you definitely want to mix it up a little bit versus um, just making it sound familiar, right? Uh, Jen, I don't imagine there's a book of food cliches in the library, is there? <laughs> I would like that book myself. Um, I think, you know, if you, uh, helpful reference, um, I think also just, just you start listening to the way people describe food and reading more. I mean, that's the best advice I can give you. Read as, um, the, you know, the best food writing collections are awesome because they're all in one um, collection. And one of the ones that I do recommend is from the 2019 one. Um, so that would be highly um, recommended. And what I end up doing in those books is I end up highlighting descriptions I like, um, and then finding different ways to say how what they said for the food that I'm talking about. Um, you know, I, Jennifer said, you know, I had to do a catalog search first, unfortunately not. Yeah, I can give you some examples of some of the things that I switched out, but still created similar imagery. And maybe that will help too. Um, and for me, it was just going back and saying, how can I say this differently, right? Um, let's see. So um, I talked about the scene about how to eat a flour tortilla with mantequilla. So in this particular, um, this is still pretty close to the beginning. So when I suddenly realized what gluten-free really meant, no more flour tortillas, I was devastated. Up until then, my favorite way to eat a flour tortilla was to wait for a generous amount of butter to melt and pull in the center. Sometimes I added the butter while the tortilla heated on the comal. Once the butter melted, I'd use my fingers to gently rip apart the edges and dip each bite into the puddle. I'd repeat the process over and over, making my way to the center until the last bite, which was used to wipe down the remaining butter off the plate. 
I then contemplated the event by licking the butter of my off my fingers. This is what mis abuelitas taught me, savor each bite. So savor each bite. That alone is a very familiar term, right? But what came before it was not necessarily familiar to everyone. Um, and I actually, my husband was making fun of me at the time. I actually started the ritual of eating my rice flour tortillas every morning um, to see what was it that I was connecting to. And that's, I remember that I caught myself eating it like that one day and I was like, oh my God, this is what I used to do with the regular flour tortillas. So I think also reliving the moment um, and sometimes reliving it may also tell you, I don't even like this anymore. Um, and I think that's also something to adapt into practice into food writing is you're re-examining the way you process emotions through food. So you have to re-examine the experience itself too. Um, you know, or if you don't crave it, why don't you crave it? Or, if, or know when you eat it, right? Um, I think for me, when I was highly consumed with writing at the time, um, I was eating flour tortillas and mantequilla because it was the easiest and fastest thing and it made me feel good. Sometimes I had it with a glass of wine and I'm like, why am I eating a flour tortilla with butter and a glass of wine? Um, and then I realized, oh, it's comfort and I needed something just to keep me going with whatever I was working on. So um, then the other description that I wanted to share. So one of the things that I was adapting into this piece was also like creating a new images for your traditional abuelita, right? Um, and, and again, that goes to exploring different descriptions. Um, and with my, my, my abuelita Maria Luisa, she's super traditional. Like that woman has never tasted a drop of alcohol. Um, she did everything for my grandfather. Um, and at the same time, my grandfather was very macho. Um, so I would question that all the time. Um, but then I, you know, one of the things that I started contemplating when I was writing this piece is how her and I are alike. And I think um, that also surprised me as well. And then I started deconstructing like what it meant um, for me not to have the rituals that she had, right? Um, so just giving you the scene is again, comparing like how you can use different descriptions to um, embody an emotion and, and, and share it with the reader, right? So I watched my abuelita attentively. After she added each ingredient, I asked for exact measurements. Abuelita Maria Lisa merely showed me how to pinch my fingers and cut my hand, cup my hands. I have to admit, I knew then I would never be able to make tortillas like her, just like I will never live her life. She was 75, I was 34. We were both already familiar with loss. She had her first child at 18, my father, who died when he was 36. Losing my father at age at the age of 13 changed my role as the eldest in my family. I was expected to be strong and be the breadwinner, like my father, for the sake of my mother and younger sisters. I viewed that loss as my first step towards independence, yet also the catalyst to denying my domestic role, the only role Abuelita Maria Luisa could embrace. Um, and then I go into like talking about how she was countering what my grandfather was doing, right? So I kept observing how she moved her arms. She held them centered to the mound of flour. They were surprisingly muscular and robust. In her way, she was a bracero like her hus husband. She smashed all the ingredients with her hands, making fist after fist, feeling the texture between her fingers and adding a little more scalding hot water. I mimicked her every move and found it all physically challenging. She observed me as well and disapproved when I pulled my hands out of the bowl to avoid being burned. Um, so I think, you know, again, revisiting some of those memories and attaching yourself to those fine details that maybe you see, but you haven't processed, right? Um, and being able to describe it to the reader, what, what that experience was like for you. Um, and including it in, in whatever shape or form you can in the piece, right? So I ended up writing four different sections and then finding a way to glue them together. So if you can only start at one place, that's okay. Start at that place. It doesn't have to be your beginning. And you 
tell yourself that, right? Like this is not the beginning of my essay. This is just a memory that I can really get into right now that might lead me to a beginning or an end. Um, and then drawing those uh, parallel references with food and with the experience. And so some of the times my, when I was talking about my grandmother's are really lengthy pieces. So then I went back and would break them up into smaller pieces and add food references in between them. And that helped me a lot because what, you know, we all know that as writers, when you start your flow and you start writing, um, you don't want to stop if you are really into it, but then you realize you wrote something that's not at all what your goal was. So how can you convert that, you know, the same way, like with food, like what ingredient is missing to give it that, that final, um, taste at the end, right? Like how do you make it a food piece? Yes. Just, just says I heard writing is rewriting all the time. That's, I mean, I, I would say that too. I'll, it, you have to rewrite. Um, and I, when I teach teenagers, I always say your first draft is throw up on paper. And I want to, I want to know what comes after that, because once you can get through the cliches and get through the, the familiar descriptions, what comes after that? So sometimes you have to write like, like, like I say, throw up on paper, which is a horrible phrase to use while talking about food, but sometimes you have to get through that to get to the good stuff. Um, and that's something that I always recommend, right? It's don't treat your first attempt as a final, treat it as one of four drafts, one of five drafts. I can't even tell you how many drafts that piece for Eater. Um, I remember it was about four, but it probably was more because there was a lot of um, Google Doc code, uh, you know, questions and rephrasing um, and one sitting with my editor. So, that's the other thing. And also reading it out loud helps tremendously. Um, I still read everything out loud, even my emails to people sometimes, just to make sure I'm not missing a beat or a word, right? Um, or if, if it doesn't sound clear to me, that means it's not reading clear to the other person either. So that has been extremely helpful. Oh, I am going to give you now some references which will also be included in um, the prompt. Let me find them. Can you tell that I've been out of the loop and using Zoom? Um, okay, so for cultural references, uh, which will this will be in the in the prompt that I'll send out to, um, to Jennifer after this. I, I highly recommend Eater, especially the one that Gustavo Ariano curated, the Mexican food in, um, in the U.S. It's a great collection um, and it has, you know, such a vast um, like co uh, collection of, of essays by chefs, by um, travelers, by um, other folks like, I mean, that, that have experienced Mexican food across the U.S. in different regions. And so you get, if you skim through all of them or read them thoroughly, whichever you prefer, um, you'll really pick up on different styles of writing and food. And that includes wine, Mexican flour tortillas, um, gluten intolerance, you know, one that we just read. And then for memoir, short stories and recipes, um, because this collection doesn't include recipes, but the, this one does. Um, one of the, my favorite, absolute favorite food books that I've read early on in life was Aphrodite um, by Isabel Allende. And that includes um, short stories of where the food origin, like, or the practice and ritual, but it's also about aphrodisiacs. So it's really engaging. Um, and then it gives all the recipes at the end of the book. So you still get access to, to recreate the recipes. Um, and then I, anything by Natalie Eve Garrett, I highly recommend. She did Eat Joy and she did the um, Artist and Writer's Cookbook, which I have, both of them have, you know, I have both of them. And the Artist and Writer's Cookbook even has shorter vignettes of short stories. So again, if you really want to uh, focus on shorter pieces, I recommend reading that. And then for style and contemporary themes, the best American food writing. Um, I particularly like, like I said, 2019 one, but there's an all of, and any one that you pick up, you're going to find at least one story you can 
probably uh, relate to or replicate the templates, the template of style. Um, and then I talked about Marissa Higgins piece. Um, so the two, oh, 2018 and 2019 are some of the best American food writing uh, collections that I like. And then this one, these two are really uh, focused on a particular audience, um, vegan race wars, right? Um, so talking about um, how white veganism versus POC veganism is dealt with, you know, in society. Um, and then another one that I, that is a similar topic uh, to Marissa Higgins' piece is the talking about food deserts, like um, why like why do people eat junk food, right, in poor neighborhoods? And so that one was another one. So that those two add a different type of social um, commentary on issues that not just focused on food or a dish, um, but it's on social issues and in society that revolve around food. So those two are more on the political point of view, and then the rest are a little bit more about memoir and narrative. And now, to, now that you know all of this so far, <laughs> oh look, the library has the 2018 edition of the Best American Food Writing in our collection. Yay, nothing like free books, right? Um, so I highly, yeah, check that out. And then also note that when you are, again, using a reading through the best American food writing, make notes of the stories you like. You can find them online. Almost all the newer versions, like probably from like 2000, I don't know, 10 and on, I believe, are their stories are still available online. So you can Google the writer's name and the, and the title and you can find them. And then, so therefore you can return the book on time to the library and you still have access to the pieces that you like for, if you like a particular style or template of, of sharing um, food, you know, topics, right? So now that you have all of this information, let's practice on how would you write a food description, right? So we only have Jess and Jennifer to participate in this. So in 10 words or less, Describe your favorite adult snack, All right? Um, and I, I will do it too, and I'm gonna do it on the spot. I mean, I already know what my favorite adult snack is because I've done these workshops before, but I've never described it on the spot. So let's see if I can do this. If I've had a particular, let's see if I can do another 10 words, right? For a, stress, for a stressful day, I like salty and buttery um, popcorn. For a stressful day, I like salty and buttery popcorn. Oh, that's more than some words, but I do love words, right? Um, but the whole point is, again, to express emotion um, and then talk about the food, right? So, Jess, Jennifer, would you like? to make an attempt, an emotion, and a favorite adult snack. If not, we can go into questions. I think they're thinking. So if you're watching this video, try it. And then maybe it'll develop into an essay, right? Oh, I love that line. Jess Romero says, my heart wants chorizo, but my budget says Fruit Loops. That, now you, now you have to go read those essays about um, the two that I pointed out about, uh, about social issues and, you know, eating while you're poor. I think you'll find a lot of references there that you'd like. That's a great line. That's way better than mine. My heart wants chorizo, but my budget says Fruit Loops. Yes. Jennifer, had, oh, my snack of choice is deep dark chocolate. Nice. That's my husband's snack of choice too. There's something about dark chocolate that people like. I, I don't like dark chocolate. I rather have, I don't know. I rather have, I think even, I don't like dark chocolate. <laughs> I rather have milk chocolate or uh, cheddar 
Cheddar popcorn is another go-to for mine. Oh, Jennifer hates milk chocolate. Wow, I don't like dark chocolate. Okay, so I do wanna, um, <laughs> makes it easier to not buy candy bars in the store, yes. So just being free, you'd be surprised how many things have gluten in it. Ice cream, y'all, ice cream has gluten in it. Unless it's like a, you know, high-end made in the store ice cream. But if it's processed, like um, anything in the frozen department, I probably can't eat, so. Oh, Morgan's ice cream, they, they focus on gluten-free and vegan ice cream, yes. See, that's um, my biggest problem is that I love like real food. I don't do um, non-dairy stuff because I just like cheese too much. So it's really hard sometimes to find things that are, that are gluten-free and, and, and still include yummy, amazing flavors and, of, of milk products. But I will try out Morgan's ice cream. Jess says, uh, yeah, non, not dairy half of the time. Cool. Yeah, I have found some amazing folks doing gluten-free pastries. Um, one of them is Mariposa Bakery in Oakland, California, and they actually ship. Shipping becomes more expensive than the food sometimes, but it's amazing gluten-free. Um, nobody does tortillas. What, oh, yeah, that's what I was going to get back to. When my piece came out at Eater, had so many people emailing me that they can res that resonated with them that they know exactly how I feel. I also got free gluten free tortillas mailed to me. It was really interesting. Um, people sent me uh, different companies sent me their tortillas to try out. So that was a real interesting uh, outcome of that essay. But I also got a lot of folks of different cultures that not necessarily couldn't eat flour but couldn't eat like red meat or couldn't eat spices of certain kinds because they realized they built an allergy to it. So there's this huge population of, of folks with different from different cultures that have um, been, you know, told that they can't eat the food that they grew up with. Um, yeah, diabetes is one I'm interested in exploring. Yeah, so I mean, I think, I think there's a lot of, again, tied to culture through our food. So when you have to stop for health reasons, which is a privilege. And that's something else that I spoke to in my essay, that it is a privilege um, to be able to prioritize your health over culture. Um, you know, it becomes this thing where you start to deconstruct, like what, how can you have it as, um, and still preserve your, how can you not let go of it and still preserve your culture? And I have found a lot of amazing um, vegetarian Mexican places. There's one in San Antonio that I love, um, and they're vegan and gluten free. So unfortunately, like that has been my experience. I have to go I, vegan and gluten free, but not necessarily just gluten free stuff, right? Um, and then there's a lot of vegan places that do vegan food, but are not at all gluten free. So any type of um, like vegan patty usually has gluten in it. And it's, you know, what is what it is. It's, it's the glue that holds things together. So if you are having food that doesn't have that texture to, to hold together, then they add flour to it. That's why some ice cream has gluten in it too. So, all right. Um, did you want to ask any questions, Jess and Jennifer? So if somebody wanted to get started with this type of writing, um, besides just, you know, the things you've already given us, what would be your one great tip for them? One, I think, is like brainstorming. Well, one, you have to choose a, a dish, a particular food, right? Like, so, but brainstorming on why you want to write about that food, right? Like what is it? What meaning is behind it? If you just want to share the recipe, that's pretty easy to do. But if you want to share the memory, um, you have to ask yourself those questions from the prompt. Why? Why is this dish? Why would this dish be important to someone else? Right? Like you have to emphasize why is this important to you so that an another person can understand why it should be important to them. Right? And what is someone's options for getting published with this type of writing? So 
I always say pitch to your local eater. They actually pay. I got paid to write that essay and I always tell, I felt, I tell, I joke because I tell people, it's like they, they uh, paid me to go through therapy. Um, and that was a great outcome. So Eater is a great resource. Um, you know, the other part is now I always tell folks like you, you can definitely see what, what other folks have been published in um, to research that. Um, another thing I always tell folks to start a blog because a blog will make you a better writer because um, you will have a deadline. If you say, I'm going to do this monthly, then you have a set deadline for yourself and then you, you have your friends and family read it and you'll know what's working and what's not working. Um, that's another option. Uh, I personally like to get paid for my writing these days. <laughs> so, you know, keep scoping out uh, opportunities that you can do that. And there's other, you know, like the local Chronicle um, is always looking for food reviews as well. Um, so that's, now you have to pay attention to what type of reviews they publish. It may not necessarily, they probably don't want your childhood memories. They want you just to talk about the food. And But if you focus on region, that is something that everybody can understand when you're doing food reviews, right? Like, you know, you can write a food review of a particular barbecue place in Lockhart, Texas, and nobody ever gets tired of that place. So um, that's a sure bet that you can have a different experience to talk about, right? Um, so I think if you tie it to, again, something that people are interested in, in a bigger way and then narrow down the topic to connect it to you. It's a good way to look at places that you can submit to. Um, and then there's always zine making. I love zines because you're saying I don't need someone to publish me. I can publish myself. Um, and that's something I always encourage libraries to do because, you know, if you do hold up, hold a writing series, and someone writes a story out of it, you can publish a zine pretty easy out of all the stuff a library has. All you need is a copier and a stapler and you got it. You got a published uh, you know, zine. And, and that in itself lends itself to another like group of folks in the community, right? You may, it's accessible, it's affordable, um, and you're sharing knowledge um, in, in a grassroots way as well. All right, well, I want to say thank you very much for being with us this evening, and uh, thank you uh, for joining us. Our next writing shop will be in the our next writing workshop will be in November, and we will be discussing writing your fears. Uh, please keep an eye out on our website calendar at fortworthlibrary.org for more information. And we did record this and all of our previous writing workshops, and you can find them on our YouTube channel. Be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications to find out about our great programs. So thank you again. I hope you have a great evening. And I hope that uh, we got some good in, and uh, great tips to get ourselves writing and get out there and, and just do it. Thank, thank you. you.